president of many amazing technologies. Al, how are you today? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for inviting me. You, you need to do something about that music, though. We'll, we'll work on that after. Have you got some new music for me? <laughs> I think so. You, you, send no, all me, good. you send me an audio clip, and I'll use it in future shows. All right, all right, all right. So you, I know you travel quite a bit. You were just in IDUG where you gave this presentation in Rotterdam as a keynote. It got great reviews. I'm looking forward to seeing it today. Um, tell us a little something about yourself personally, things that people might not know outside your work life. <laughs> well, uh, outside my work life, uh, I've got three girls and um, it's, it's all females in my house. So I got three girls, three of them are in college, uh, they, they, they cost a lot of money, but they're, they're my girls, you know, so that's where I spend most of my time, uh, two go to Kansas university. One goes to K state because you, you can't get them all. Uh, and none of them are in computer science. If you can believe that I couldn't convince them, but they're, they're doing all right. I, I've got one pharmacy. Uh, second one is, um, uh, in, you know, pre-law and then the third one's audiology. So I'm, I'm not complaining, but man, I tried to get some computer scientists out of it, but, uh, you know, look, didn't work out. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Do you have any hobbies? Do I have any hobbies? I got hobbies that uh, I don't always get to. I love um, golf. Uh, I spend my time looking for my ball most of the time, which is, which is good. <laughs> I, I like golf. I like home projects. Uh, I like to, to you know get away and, and do something completely different, uh, like uh, adding additions onto my home or, or refinishing a basement or something like that, building cabinets. Uh, so that's where I spend spend a lot of my time. But a lot of it's, like I say, with, with girls and um, helping them out with whatever they need, uh, you know, helping them out with their, uh, with, um, you know, their apartments, et cetera. You know, I have two girls as well. And I've often thought that when when God gives us girls, it's kind of like payback for our behavior when <laughs> we were in college. <laughs> I got a lot of payback. That's all right. I love it. I love Girls it. are very special. All right, let's move along. This is the required gibberish. The opinions expressed are that of Scott Hayes and the show guests do not necessarily reflect that of IBM Corporation or the IBM community. DB2 is a registered trademark of IBM, which is also a registered trademark. We make no claims to any marks belonging to anyone. This event is being recorded. Replays will be publicly available. Please mind your matters. So what's ahead? Well, I have a few news bits. Then we're going to have Al's presentation, which is very exciting. We've got a couple polling questions for you, and then we'll do our thank yous. Upcoming shows, make sure you've registered uh, for DB2 Performance with Ragu on Tech on the 21st of November. 5th of December, uh, Paul Zakopoulos is talking about AI and Watson and the speed of everything. He's an excellent speaker. He's written like 19 books. He's been on TV. He's a great guy. Don't miss that one. 19th of December, Peter Coleman. He's going to be talking about the new DB2 console. What's next after DSM? Hey, Scott, it's a little hard to hear you. It might be, a, it sounds like you're away from the microphone or something. Just want to let you know. I really had to dig in there. Sorry. All right. I'm going to speak up as best I can. Okay. There you go. Some URLs to visit. Make sure you are involved with the IBM community. Go to ibm.com slash community and join if you haven't already. Lots of great discussions there around IBM products and how-tos. Uh, there's a new DB2 Augmented Data Explorer. It's a really cool tool that I got a demonstration of a couple months ago. 
at the Gold Consultant Briefings. Great way to explore your your data, and it's free. And get there and check it out. Uh, IBM is now putting DB2 samples on GitHub. GitHub, and uh, there's a new DB2 console. Just talked about that, Peter Coleman. You can get in on the early user program by visiting here and uh, db2json. There's some free books you can get. Check out that URL. And IBM Champions, uh, the renewal, I guess, is expiring on November 9th, but November 22 is the new deadline for uh, new champions. Okay. Let's get Al on. <laughs> Al, I'm going to make you the presenter now. All right, fantastic. So I told Al that this kind of like a couple of guys sitting at a bar having a having a beer. It'll be a little bit conversational between he and I, and uh, but mostly Al's going to do the talking because I'm not as smart as him. Yeah, uh, whatever. Al, I can see your screen. You got all the okay. dads on the bottom, but uh, otherwise we see. All right, we're ready. Can you hear me okay? And you see the screen fine, right? We can hear you and see the screen. Well, like you said, you said, uh, hey, this is like us, us having a drink, so I thought I'd have a little fun today. And speaking of, when you asked me earlier what, what my hobbies are, this may be not appropriate, but one of my hobbies is, is wine. I enjoy wine. I like visiting Napa. Uh, I collect a few wines, but I don't collect them for long because they get uh, – we we drink them quickly, uh, but uh, that's, that's another another hobby of mine. I anyway, love, I love wine too, especially uh, Malbecs from the Mendoza, Argentina region. I'm a red. Cabs are in or, or mine. Oh, there you go. Here, go to Australia and get yourself a Shiraz. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. All right, so look, um, I thought it, what what I would do today, and uh, this was I've, I've done several pitches this year included IDUG, which is DB2 User Groups Conference and, and the Informix User Group Conference and several other uh, conferences. I, I just came um, back from a AZ conference. So um, I, this is a little different for me because I like to see the, the crowd as I'm as I'm doing a pitch or whatnot so I can I can feel feel the energy. But um, I tend to have a lot of energy, so I'm going to kick it up here as best that I can. And I thought what I'd do is a little bit uh, of my greatest hits, it's not exactly what I presented in IDUG as we had talked about Scott, but there's a little bit, a um, little bit of variation. But the first thing I would, I would say is, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to the journey to, to AI, not the journey to Al, but the journey to AI. And as a, as a formal introduction, I don't like titles, but I am the, the vice president of data and AI development. Now, specifically within that, on the AI side, it's it's Watson Studio, machine learning, open scale. These are products that let you build, uh, deploy, manage, run machine learning models that you create, a data scientist or otherwise. It doesn't have to be a data scientist, it be a citizen data science scientist. And then the data side, uh, I was given the, the, the pleasure of, of being able to lead DB2Z at the beginning of this year. So I've got both sides of what I would call the latter-day AI, which I'll explain, which is fantastic as far as I'm concerned and, and very exciting. Uh, a, a, a legendary product in a product in Watson that's becoming legendary. So um, for anybody listening, please reach out to me anytime. There's my contact information. I do have a podcast just as well that I do every week called Making Data Simple, though we talk about darn near everything. But it's usually premised on data. So um, real quick, active uh, on Twitter. Yeah, well, I am. I so I, uh, I try to be as social as as possible. It's so it's um, easy, easy for people to find you. Yes, it is. Thank you. I uh, well, the one thing I would say, and you know, this is the the Data View show. So uh, I think we've got a lot of folks that listen that are are predicated on data, which. You know, you're my kind of people because uh, that's where I come from. I've, I've been in 25 years of the industry within data. So uh, I get it. Uh, data is one of my passion along with clients and, and innovation. Um, but I know that there's some of you out there listening that would say, oh, my God, he's going to talk about AI again. And the thing I would reiterate is that when you hear that word AI, you should, you should, be, you should be thrilled, thrilled, it, particularly if you're in data, but anywhere across the industry. 
because data is at a premium that makes everybody that's involved with data incredibly valuable. There's a reason many companies, not IBM, but many companies are trying to take your data. Uh, it, it, remember, if 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 you're not if you're not paying for something, you're the one that's being sold. And it's all about data. AI is nothing without data. It's, it's just we're at a situation in our history where we've got so much data, we got to have something to take care of it because we can't sift through it manually, and that's AI. And I recently went to uh, California, and I thought, you know, I was in California. I, I like to, another one thing I like to do is I'm a continuous learner. Uh, that's probably my biggest habit. One thing is I like is history. And I so I used an example that's kind of stuck with me. This will be the third time that I've used it is the, the gold rush in, in California. I think it's a good analogy to where we are today. Uh, in 1848, there were 157,000 humans in California. Only 157,000. I think that's just remarkable in and of itself because I think there's somewhere like 40 million right now. So uh, there. It, they're, it's going to get crowded if we if we continue on that path, pace. But 150,000 of them were Native Americans, and then all of a sudden, this gentleman by the name of John Sutter discovers gold. Gold, and uh, it, there's various uh, scenarios here of what re really called the caused the gold rush. But I think the predominant story is that the president James Polk announced in his in, inaugural address in 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 1848. Uh, that there was gold in them, their heels. And then 10 months from that period, 100,000 people migrated to California, the largest migration in U.S. history. But the, So why am I telling you this story? The interesting thing is that the miners and the prospectors, they weren't the ones that made the money. Uh, you know, maybe a few of them, a couple of them. The fortunes were made with the merchants, those that were providing tools, those that were providing services. So no different than today, if you control the data and you provide those services, you've got an opportunity to put yourself in a high value position. And, and back to California, Levi Strauss, by example, he started there, he was bringing, building canopies for uh, wagons and then he got into the, the jeans business. Wells Fargo with Henry Wells and William Fargo started there and John Studebaker was, was selling wheelbarrows uh, before he went into the car business. And then the funny thing is I took that story which I think resonates ex extremely well, but it's repeated over history almost everywhere. And I was in Rotterdam when I did the DB2 user group pitch, and then I talked about the Dutch East India Company. And I won't go into that detail because I'm gonna spend a lot of time just in stories alone, and I, I wanna get on to some other things. But um, it was the same thing. The Dutch East India Company provided services, brought silks, fabrics, fabric, silver, porcelain, everything back from Asia. Uh, they were the ones that controlled the goods. But the th one thing I would say is not everything the Dutch East India Company did was good, as you know, as history would say. And so in, in that vein, I think there's a lot of people that are worried about AI and the Terminator. For me, it's worried about those that um, you know, are malicious with our data. It's about ethics. Those are the things I'm worried about. I'm not worried about the Terminator coming anytime soon. Hey, Al, I still see your very first slide. Yes, I haven't went. I, I, okay. This is me talking. So this is what happens. <laughs> All right, let me let me jump in. I will jump in. I just wanted to set the stage here. And the first thing I got to say is uh, I do make a joke. This joke is kind of uh, now a, a joke for those that are around me, and they send me emails and stuff. But I, I you know, with Arial font has killed me. It's like Al on Al. And I and somebody even in LinkedIn after they heard I was going to be on the Data View show sent this to me and said, "Oh, it's going to be Al on Al." Well, yeah, I feel the pain. I, I would lobby for everybody to go to Times Roman or IBM Plex so that I can tell we can tell the the difference, like Al on AI. Otherwise, <laughs> this is what I get. This is what this is what I see in my email, and I'm not kidding you. If your name begins with Al, then you're clicking on every one of these because you see Al. There's only one been one breakthrough. Al hits the barrier of meaning. I'm like, what the hell? Go in there and then it, I find, oh, it's 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 AI. Uh, it is a torment for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't have picked a better industry to be in right now. This is terrific. All right, so let's talk a little bit about transformation. This is one of my favorite favorite slides, and I'll, I'll, uh, you'll you'll get it here in a minute. This is New York City, 1900 Easter Sunday, Fifth Avenue. And you can see all these horse and buggies. I love this picture. I think it's a cool picture. It is. The question is, do you see 
Scott, do you see the uh, the car? There's one car in there, at least as far as I can tell. Um, no, I don't. I need to look very closely, but I'll my help. eyes are open. I'll help you. There it is. All right. Okay. That's one car, 1900, right? So flash forward to 1913. Only 13 years later, now we see nothing but cars. This is this is uh, Easter Sunday, Fifth Avenue, 1913, New York. I don't see any now, horse that, manure either. There you go. I'll help you out again. Oh, there's there's the horse. <laughs> there's one guy. There's one horse that's been spooked probably all all day long there, going crazy. One 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 poor guy couldn't afford a car or something. But that was 13. 13 short years. I think that's amazing. That's how fast, that's when the world was very, very slow, right? Uh, and, you know, 13 years, New York has transformed, as you can see there. So the, the thing is now is, um, now we're talking about AI. And, you know, AI is all over. And I do think it's the transformation of our time. And a story that I like to tell that I think is going to be interesting because th there's two Oxford economists in 2013, they went on record and concluded or predicted that 47% of US jobs were gonna be at high risk from automation in the next 20 years, so by 2033. And they put their money where their mouth is because they put uh, a 99% probability that telemarketers gone, which not gonna hurt my feelings, but 99% <laughs> of telemarketers gone. 98% <laughs> of sports referees, which, that's interesting because you think you still want somebody out there, you know, just uh, referee support sports, but 98% sports uh, referees, 97% cashiers, 96% chefs. I could keep going down the list. Um, and a lot of people look at that, I think, and say, oh, 20 years, they're too aggressive as usual. But, I mean, look, by, the, by, the, by 1920, going back to the car analogy, which everybody can kind of relate to, cars dominated big cities by 1920. So that took, you know, we, we saw 1900 to 1920, that's 20 years in a very slow age. But like I said, um, I'm not a, a naysayer. I think there's plenty of, uh, we're not going to be all golfing, unfortunately. Uh, it, will, it will replace it with other work. Uh, but we do have to watch out for how people are using our data. But the one I wanted to get through here is not new. In 1959, Arthur Samuel created a program to play checkers. IBM stock went up 15% the next day. Arthur Samuel was the guy that created, a, uh, invented the hash table. Um, in 1996, IBM's Deep Blue beat uh, Gary Kasparov. He's still struggling with it. That is no joke, uh, because uh, you know he claims that there was a defect in in IBM Deep Blue that when they made a move, it was an errant move. But he was so consumed by it that he that he lost his mind and lost the game. At least that's his story. And then in in 2011. Uh, as you know, hopefully most people know that Watson beat uh, human competitors on, on Jeopardy. So it's not new. So then you ask yourself, well, why is this happening? And it's really because of three major things, data, algorithms, storage, and compute. And um, you know, so, so it's really like, you know, we've got more data than we've ever uh, had before, and it's increasing at an astronomical pace. Um, from an algorithm perspective, we've got supervised, unsupervised learning techniques and, and deep learning, et cetera. And then the storage and compute, we've seen the cost of storage and compute, uh, compute plummet, making this all uh, possible in terms of presenting an inflection point. So a couple, couple of uh, numbers I wanted to throw at you just to continue with um, the predictions of what IA, AI is going to mean to the business. Uh, Gartner reports that by 2021, there's going to be $2.9 trillion in business value generated by AI. There's going to be 6.2 million workers, uh, worker hours saved by AI aug augmentation. Um, so real, real change. And as far as I'm concerned, though, I take that down to my day to day. And the interesting thing is that humans make 35,000 decisions a day. And um, and it's all about being able to automate much of these mundane uh, decisions. Uh, you want an example I often give is is Steve Jobs is often credited with um, with uh, being a genius in, in developing the the iPhone or whatever. I think he's a genius because 
he wore the same black turtleneck, blue jeans, and, and New Balance sneakers every day. It was pretty clear that Steve understood he had a finite capacity to make excellent decisions, so he left that one on the table and said, I'm not going to have to worry about that one every day. <laughs> All right, so so talk about AI. Um, so it's all about unlocking the value of the data. And so there's three areas that, that we're essentially, AI is gonna help us tremendously. Um, first off, it's predicting what's gonna happen in your business. Secondly, it's optimizing time to accomplish high, high value work. And thirdly, automating processes and, and decisions to, to reveal uh, insights. That, that's essentially what it is at the end of the day. And all built in statistics, et cetera. Um, but then I come back, and this is where, in particular, when I'm talking with a data group, I look at it and say, well, why aren't businesses further along? Now, if you're a previous DBA or you've been in the data business for any period of time, time you've got to recognize some of these. In that, um, you know, most of, we've got a, a ton of disparate data types. Data sources are all over the place. We've had uh, companies creating data marts, data lakes, which now are, are data swamps. Um, a lot of times only IT can get the, the, the data. Sometimes you don't even, they're, they're antiquated systems. I mean, it goes on and on. So at the end of the day, um, uh, M MIT Sloan has said like 49% of C-level executives and, and decision makers reported that their organization is unable to deploy the AI technologies because their data is not ready. This is a major issue. That's why when I start this discussion, I say, look, if you're in the data business and you know how to leverage this opportunity, you're in a great spot. You're in a great spot. Not, not only that, but I'd say one more thing is, so even if you can get to all the data, you've got to make sure that you can organize data because if you, you, there's no data if you can't find it. Um, so you've got to have a good governance uh, solution I often refer to governance as um, go governance does to data what libraries uh, did for books. And as a side note, the thing that's interesting for me is over the course of history, uh, you know, complex civilizations, it, their, their full scripts survived if they had uh, if they had cataloging and ability to retrieve that data. In other words, you know, Sumerians. Pharaonic Egypt, ancient China, we've got all their scripts because they had the cataloging to match. There are many, many more scripts over history. They didn't have that catalog, cataloging, and we, they're, they're MIA today. We can't see them. So here's what I wanted to do. So then, then this is a, a video that I love because this describes every discussion that I have with a client. I walk into a client, everybody's excited about AI, and then we come back to reality. Are we able to play this? I'm going to play it for you now. I'll, I'm going to okay. hit it. Customer data? You got it. Tons of it. And you know your customer. Take Jack, for example. Jack loves waffles. How do you know? Because Sunday Jack said so on social. And last Friday, he'd been searching for a waffle maker in your online store. Boom! Now you're ready to talk to him. Because you know Jack. Except... Jack was actually just carving up for a 5K at the end of the week. He's not so much a waffle freak as a fitness freak, but you already assigned him to a target audience, so you're still talking to him about all things waffle. Jack deletes the email without opening it, and then he ignores your SMS and closes your ad. So you don't know Jack. And to give Jack an experience that would have actually been right for him, you should have had an AI-powered platform that connects all your data to show that he's not obsessed with brunch, He's obsessed with running. And you also would have known that Jack is actually Jacqueline. If your marketing can't make sense of your data, you don't know Jack. Hopefully everybody hear that. Do you hear that okay, Scott? I, I heard it great on my side. Hopefully our audience heard that. All right, good. So that's, that's the scenario that happens. We start out and we say, all right, we got this. And then we find out uh, we don't have this because we've, you've got to have a solid information architecture. Yet again... Uh, this is why those in the data business have a, have, have a great opportunity here. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm a little ahead. There we go. So that's where we get to a point where I visit a ton of clients. They want AI, and I've 
and, and there's always things we can do. We can do smaller data sets. We can figure out areas where they do have the, the right level of information architecture. But the thing is, there's no AI without uh, information architecture. The AI is the tip of the iceberg. The rest is, is, is below. The other thing I would say, if, if, if I've got it, I'm, I'm keeping monitoring time, I think it's important for businesses to have a different relationship with data. This is a culture change. There's a lot of the businesses out there, again, like I said, that are, are trying to take your data. I pride myself on IBM because we, we don't want anything to do with your data. We want, we want uh, to be able to help you um, gain insights from, from your data, but that's not always the case. That's why I say we got to be very, very careful. But you, you got to have a, very, a, a relationship with data. The more data that you have, the better decisions that you can make. And there's a, there's a story that I find interesting. I'll say it here. Uh, very quickly, is the story of Signet Bank. Most people haven't heard of Signet Bank. Scott, you ever heard of Signet Bank? I have not heard of that bank. Uh, so it's a it's a classic story of the the 1990s, uh, and, and the short version is this: in in the 1980s, uh, data science had kind of transformed some of the computer uh, credit business, but essentially at that time, credit cards had uniform pricing, and they had uniform pricing for two reasons. One, there was not adequate information systems to deal with uh, the differentiated pricing. In other words, they didn't have the data. Secondly is the banks believed, hey, customers are never gonna stand for price discrimination. And around 1992, two visionaries, Richard Fairbanks and Nigel Morris came along and they said, you know, look, if we can get some of the data, we can change this and really be efficient in terms of how we do uh, consumer credit. I mean, nowadays, you know, of things like credit lim or credit limits, what I was going to say, uh, cash back, loyalty points. Uh, this really began with these two gentlemen because what happened is they said, hey, look, give us the data. If you allow us to go get the data, we'll be able to be more strategic about how we, um, how we give uh, credit, uh, you give your, your essentially your, your, your credit card, what I want to call it, your percentage that you pay. So they went to many of the big banks. The big banks said, no freaking way. And the reason they said that is, if you're following along here, is because what these guys wanted to do is they said, we wanted to give out different credit terms to different people and test it. So they're gonna have a lot of defaults. You know, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to miss some. So they're gonna lose money. And the big bank said, no freaking way. There was one little um, bank in Virginia called Signet Bank. And they said, we'll do that. We're in on that. And because they knew that there was a small, most of the profit came from uh, some of the biggest customers and they wanted to be able to skim that off uh, of the, the larger banks. So they said we would do it. And so they started trying all different kinds of terms, uh, credit terms with various customers. And they had a pretty decent uh, default uh, rating, I think, or what it was, it's called a charge off rate, which was, they went from 2.9% to 6%. And that's not good. Any board in the world would go, what the hell is going on? Uh, because um, they, were, they were buying data, essentially. They were testing all these data terms so they could buy that data. And ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, took them a few years. They started getting really good at predicting and differentiating clients based on uh, their profile so that they could give them different ratings, different opportunities, different, different deals. And uh, you may not know Signet Bank, but then they spun off and they became Capital One. That's how Capital One got started. But it was a different relationship with data. Whatever you think of Capital One doesn't matter. I'm just pointing out that there's a different uh, relationship with data. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the three components that I think are critical in the industry right now. First of all, it starts with data. We already talked about that. It fuels the digital transformation. We already, I'll give you a couple more metrics, but we, we've touched on this, is only 15% uh, get what they need from data. But if you look at Forrester, they'd say 90% say that they're trying to improve the use of data as a top priority, and 71% plan to have to build a system of insights to become data-driven, right? We've also got to recognize that AI is happening right now, right now. And if you look at a report via MIT Sloan again, 39% uh, of all companies have an AI strategy in place. 20% have AI in some offerings. 5% have extensively put it uh, pervasively across uh, the, their, their organizations. The good news is, is still time, but 
uh, if you're not starting now, you're getting behind very, very quickly. You're going to be the guy that was in that wagon uh, with the, amongst the cars. And then lastly, it's a hybrid cloud world. And the reason it's a hybrid cloud world is you can look at the, the essentially the metrics here that justify that. $438 billion going towards in 2020 for private clouds, which is a CAGR of 15% between 18 and, uh, uh, 2018 and 2020. 609 billion in 2020 uh, with an 18% CAGR for private public clouds. And then the tr traditional IT is 640 billion uh, with a minus nine uh, CAGR. But most importantly, 94% of customers are using multiple cloud envi environments and 67% are using more than one cloud provider. This is why IBM would purchase a company called Red Hat. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I would say data, if we're gonna use analogies, data is the oil, um, AI is the refinery, and hybrid cloud is, is, is the pipeline. All right, so are you with me? You're still with me, Scott. I now wanna talk about how to accelerate the journey to AI. I, I, am, I am with you, and I love your little witticisms. <laughs> yeah, you may be the only one, but I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So there's two slides that I always use in my presentations and I've used them for a couple of years and people may be getting tired of them, but uh, as far as I can tell, I'm, I I'm not gonna switch them as of yet because I love these two slides. The first one is the maturity curve, what I call the maturity curve. And it divides the industry, well, a, a company's path to a digital transformation in four quadrants. And this is the journey to AI. So every company, like it's overused term, wants to get to a digital transformation. That means you're insight driven and you're data driven. So you're trying to get to that digital transformation. Usually you're going from left to right. Various companies are in various uh, spots of this model. The, the left two quadrants are spending money to save money. The right two quadrants are spending money to make money. So real quickly, uh, if, if any of the listeners have heard this before, I won't go this into detail, but I can spend, I can spend the whole hour on this, but. Uh, on the left quadrant, that's your operational side, that's your application and database. The opportunities you usually have there is cost reduction, perhaps get into cloud. And then pretty soon somebody's gonna come to you, almost all companies have had this happen and now they say, look, we need our, our sales trends and our production yields. So then you get into warehousing. All of a sudden now you're looking, taking from operational and going, all right, now I need to start creating uh, operational, all right, I'm, I need to create uh, data marts, um, the, the opportunities you may have are data lakes, uh, maybe an appliance, uh, maybe Hadoop, uh, because you're going to deal with semi-structured data, social media, whatever, and cloud. So then you're there. Now, making the transition between the left two and the right two is going from IT into the business environment. Once you go to the business environment, you hit into self-service analytics. This is, this is a... Um, I what I want to say, it's a, it's a leap off point, in which case you really drive um, value into your organization because you're giving everybody, you're democratizing data, you're giving everybody access, but it's also extremely scary because then you're thinking, all right, now I need better governance. I, I, I got to protect this data. Uh, so unified governance becomes a, a big priority. Then, but then the cool thing is then different personas start coming in like a chief data officer, uh, you have application developer, data science professionals, data analyst, et cetera. All those need uh, governance. But then the opportunities also become Spark, like a compute engine, streams, maybe IoT, et cetera. When you go from the third quarter, quadrant to the fourth quadrant, that's when magic really starts to happen because you're starting to build machine learning models. They're learning upon themselves, and they became contained within a use case by which they're able to get, you know, uh, to drive um, great uh, data value such that you get the hockey stick that we're talking about that you can see uh, on the screen. And you get 360 degree views of client data by example, and you're able to make decisions that like your competitors are not able to. That's when I go into a client for the first time, usually in the back of my mind or even in the forefront, I am talking to them about this to figure out where they are typically it depends on you know different organizations or different pieces of business, maybe in different areas. But on average, MIT Sloan looked at this with us, and 64% uh, are right in the middle. Make sense? 
It does. And I have a polling question that asks where people are on their AI journey. Let me know when you'd like me to run it. All right, I will. Thank you. So what we've done is we've taken that, that uh, maturity curve and you know, what we do is we've created what's called the AI ladder. And this is just a, a prescriptive approach, at least to help clients get from that left side to the right side. Just think of it, it being superimposed upon that, that maturity curve where you've got to collect, you got to make data simple, just, just like the name of my podcast. You got to organize, which means that, um, you know, this is all about integrating, cleansing, cataloging, governing um, the, 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 the life cycle of the data. Uh, analyzing, that's when you build, run, deploy, manage ML models. And then when you get to the infuse, this is when you have those AI use cases with pre-built application services and they speed time to value. That's your goal, to get up there as, as fast as you can with any business. The one concern I have is when I'm dealing with clients a lot is um, the higher rungs tend to be very scary and they start they started to collect, which is okay. You got to have that great information architecture, but sometimes they're moving data when they don't need to just because they can. You got to be careful. You don't want to do, if it's working, leave it. That's why it's a hybrid world. We'd like to leave, bring analytics to the data, leave that where if it's working, leave it there. And, and to do that, we can still modernize your environment. And that's where we, we want it to, our solution to be available on one, one platform, any cloud, which brings me to what we call cloud pack for data again this is our relationship with red hat in which we put our whole platform of products collect data organize data and analyze data into one platform that can be on private cloud public cloud doesn't matter can be moved between clouds because it's all microservices containerized etc the other thing is it's open if you want to bring another database in like mongodb you can do that we think our database is the best, but that doesn't matter. We want to be open. We, IBM has really promoted, and I hope we've shown that with our relationship with uh, Red Hat, that we are extremely open. You can bring in other products as well. So you're not tied down. Just like you're not tied down with the cloud, you're not tied down with, with products just the same. All right. So I want to talk about Al and AI, not Al and I, Al. <laughs> but before I do, why don't, you, why don't you hit me with that polling question? All right. Let me get it going. And the polling question is now live. Where are you along your journey to AI? We're learning about it, we have projects ramping up, or we're live with one or more solutions. And I abandoned, so, so my, I abandoned my headphones. I'm using the built-in microphone on my laptop now. Uh, hopefully the sound quality is a little sounds bit better. Sounds a little bit better. Sounds a little bit better, yes. Good. All right. Let's you want to wait for the poll to return? Or? Yeah, we're going to close the poll now and share the results. This is what people said, Al. 50% are learning about it. 36% have projects ramping up. 14% were live with one or more solutions. All right, fair enough. That's good. So let me let me talk to Al on AI then. Let's talk a little bit about this. Hey, I got another polling question from you for you. Um, first thing is I have a little pop, pop quiz that I did at the DB2 user group uh, conference that I thought was fun. And the question is, is the term artificial intelligence was coined by whom and, and what? This is how to keep everybody awake out there, even though you already got a polling question. But Yeah, we're giving, me to... we're giving this one right now. Okay. Sounds good. The term artificial intelligence was coined by, and then there's the four choices that you had on your slide. Man, you were ready. I've run a few webinars in my days. I'm getting <laughs> good at it. Good for you. Fantastic. Yeah, anytime you need a webinar set up, just get in touch with me. I'll help you. All right, let's okay. see who got it right. Our good-looking audience is, is voting. Uh, we're about 62% of people have responded. I'm going to wait for 45 seconds, six more seconds. Go well, ahead. you got to guess. Everybody plays. Got, got to give your opinion here, folks. Just guess if you don't know. Going once, going twice, closing the poll, and sharing the results. Okay. Alan. 
Here's what your audience said. I think Alan Turing in 1950. All right. Alan All Turing and John McCarthy. John McCarthy, yeah. All right, let's uh All right, let's see. Let, let's let's go through it. Um Hold on a minute. I've lost it. Here we go. All right, it's not Guido. Guido, uh, he's from the Netherlands, and I was delivering this pitch in the Netherlands, which is one way I did this, but uh, Guido uh, invented Python in 1991, which is a uh, programming language for machine learning. There you go. It's not Guido. All right, it's not Francis Allen. Francis Allen was, uh, you know, she, she created, um, essentially, uh, she optimized compilers and uh, did a lot of work around parallel execution. But she did not term artificial intelligence. It wasn't Alan Turing. Everybody thinks it's Alan Turing, but it wasn't Alan Turing. Essentially, Alan, um, he is considered the father of computing. Uh, and Winston Churchill said that uh, he reduced World War II by two years because of his code breaking skills. But it was John McCarthy that in 1995 termed artificial intelligence. He was a cognitive scientist. Uh, and I think at the time, uh, if I can get this right, I think at the time he said um, it's it's the science or engineering of intel intelligent computers. So he came up with art artificial intelligence. Hey, so that was second best or second uh, most. So yep. uh, several yep. people have get, got that. Oh, we have a fairly intelligent uh, audience. Great. Fantastic. Of course, they're listening to us. Uh, I'm I'm the least intelligent person here. All right. Uh, so let's let's what we want to do is we want to drive machine learning without human interference. The reason we want to do this, um, it all comes again. We've already talked about better data, better models. You get better decisions. That's why it's a very important. Uh, the thing that I worry about is countries and companies that are that get the, the better data. Maybe they don't protect personal information, et cetera, but they can make better decisions with that. It's an ethical issue. But the reality is, it's one way or another, better, better data, better models, better decisions. And the thing is, one thing since I've, I've taken the role of driving AI, I've probably learned more than anything else is that, um, man, there's a lot of natural bias, innate bias to, to, to human beings. Things that I would have never considered. By example, we have what's called the default effect. It's probably the easiest one to kind of, kind of consume. And, and that is that if our mind thinks we've seen a decision before, we'll make the same decision again. Even if it's not, if it's close, we're gonna, we're gonna make the same decision again because we don't have unlimited compute and storage. So we just, hey, look, we gotta get that, that decision done with. We make 35,000 of them, right? You gotta, you gotta go through them very, uh, very, very quickly. And often the big example that I often give, and it's worked every time, at least so far, it's like if I'm in a room, I ask everybody to leave and come back, they'll, say, they'll sit in the same seats. Now you could say, well, they're being polite. But the reality is some people arrive late, et cetera, almost always. There's a few outliers, but they sit right back in the same seat. I've already made that decision. I'm not going to make a, another one. But, you know, if you want some good examples of this, and it really wasn't intended around AI, there's a great book called The Undoing Project by Michael Lewis, who wrote Moneyball. And it's about two, I guess the best way I could describe it, is behavior scientists, econ economists too, like Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And they've got several examples in there how our mind is just kind of skewed in that how that uh, we have a law of, uh, of small numbers, if you will, where we'll think a lot, we'll look at a small amount of numbers and be and extrapolate, extrapolate that such that we'll make a decision off of that, assuming that it has the same properties as large samples do. It doesn't. There's so many examples they have in the books, just just really interesting when they when they polled people. Like you you could you could flip a coin uh, multiple times, and 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 people believe that if a coin is flipped and there are several heads in a row, that tail is more likely in the next flip, rather than having the same likelihood as it always does. It's 50%, no matter how many times you flipped uh, flipped um, heads or tails. Anyway, I mean those are many many examples, but it talks to the struggles that we have when we're we're creating statistics and uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, et cetera. This reminds me in a way of garbage in, garbage out, right? What you're talking about, it's kind of the flip side of your prior slide. If we put better data in, then we get better information out. Yep, I, I, um, I, I, I agree. And so they'll put, a, put a few, uh, some more impact here is, is like, let's look at what AI could possibly do here. 
Um, and the example I like probably most because it affects most folks in some way, shape, or form of skin cancer. It's the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States. Over 5 million cases are diagnosed each year. Cost it's like $8 billion, but who cares about that? I mean, it, it, that, where I'm getting to is, is more profound, and that is 100,000 of these uh, cases involve melanoma, which is the de deadliest form of skin cancer, that leads to 9,000 deaths. But the problem is, is that, um, well, let me back up. If you catch it soon, the five-year survival rate is over 98%. 98%, you're good. If you don't and you let it progress to the lymphatic system, the survival, the survival rate immediately drops as low as 16%. And the, the key here is that up to nine lesions are surgically biopsied for every one melanoma discovered, meaning dermatologists, nothing against dermatologists, it's tough, they don't know. So they're trying to guess here. And you know why? Because there's a limited supply of these specialized uh, physicians and there's an enormous potential for human error. In that same book that I talked about very quickly, uh, The Undoing Project, in the 1970s, they did a research project with uh, the Oregon Research Institute and they looked at stomach cancers. And they brought in all these doctors in and they came up with size, shape, uh, width, crater. They came up with seven factors. Uh, and they came up with a model back in the 70s, before we had all the technology that we have today. And they gave it to the scientists, the scientists went off. And then they went back to the same doctors using their model and algorithm and said, all right, guys, here's 100 pictures, almost 100 pictures of stomach ulcers. Use your seven point scale that you gave us. Tell us which are de definitely malignant and definitely uh, benign. And they did that. They sent it to UCLA. So to be objective, they sent it back. And what came back is unsettling. Not only did doctors not agree with the other doctors, they didn't agree with themselves because they put some of the same pictures in. So food for thought when you go to your doctor next. But the model that they created at that time in the 70s, because it was objective, it didn't have bias, it beat the doctors. Anyway, check out that book. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly. Just to, another example I like to give is, so what are we asking machine learning to do? Most of you can look at this picture, and what is it, Scott? I know you know what the picture is. Well, it kind of looks like a QR code, but behind <laughs> all the white splotches, it looks like I see a puppy. It's exactly what you see. But what's amazing, we don't create, it's actually not a puppy. This is 1.2 million pix, uh, megapixels that are on the screen. It's not even a picture, it's just megapixels. That's all it is. But our mind can collect organize, analyze, work right up that, that latter day eye and be able to identify that that's a dog. So we are asking, you think about it, we're trying to prescribe and ask AI to do the same stuff. That's what we're trying to program. It's pretty tough. And then with the, the, the other thing we're trying to do is then we say, we, we go from like uh, supervised learning to unsupervised learning. In other words, we take away some of the labels and we say, well, does the dog have a leash on? Does the, is the dog healthy? Uh, you got to put a lot of different things together to say, does it, do, is it light or dark outside? And we're trying to make prescriptions based on, um, or predictions, I should say, based on the information that we have. So what this leads to, what I would say is the, the AI life cycle, which is a whole life cycle in and of itself. And it's pretty lengthy. Um, you got to do data cleansing, feature engineering, all these things that I won't go around here, but even like you got to clean the data somewhat again. Uh, the data will be, be clean from a uh, traditional standpoint, but a lot of times like ML models, they don't like nulls in, in data. Uh, so you, know, you may have to clean those out, et cetera. So some other work you have to do. And so what this leads to is once you make it up the ladder, everybody's pretty excited. All right, I got that AI, I'm ready to go. 80% of the time, this is why we say 80% of the time, the data scientists start, they're, they're, they're still preparing. Where they want to do, what, what they want to do is and focus on is the, is the build and deploy phase. So I want to build these models and deploy. That's what I was hired for. That's what I, I, I did all this training for. And then the C-suite is looking at it going, hey, we just want to deploy and manage. You know, this thing didn't, didn't produce an ROI. So we have got to make sure that we're getting as much to the right of this picture as we can. So we're deployed, we're staying deployed, we're managing, we're getting the predictions and, and business value that we need. Um, our CDO has a great story that the, he talks about 
where in his previous company, uh, he brought in a bunch of data scientists to, to create this data science group. First year, they created something like 140 different models they were humming. Second year, they created zero. And that's because they were trying to keep the models up to, to date, relevant, et cetera. Started losing data scientists because they were doing more preparation than build and deploy. Bad things happen. That's where a lot of clients find themselves at the top. So what we've done is we've created what's called auto AI. What this does is automatically prepares data, applies algorithms, and builds uh, model pipelines. So to get started, what used to take weeks only takes minutes at this point. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of work to do, but it's like there's 10 steps to, to an AI model and keeping it in production. Auto AI would maybe get you through two, two, three, or something like that, get you started quickly. So you can, you can get up the, uh, or to the, to the right of that previous slide as fast as possible. Now, I do have one more video I wanted to share if we have time. We this, this will describe auto AI. In a recent competition for predicting consumer credit risk, Watson Studios Auto AI beat 90% of the participating data scientists. Let's take a look under the hood to see Auto AI in action. In the following example, we want to predict the survivors of the Titanic, the British passenger liner that sank in the Atlantic Ocean in 1912. First, we load the dataset, titanic.csv. Then, we select the survived column. Depending on the type of variable to predict, Auto AI automatically selects the metric to optimize. In this case, since this is a binary classification problem, the selected metric is AUC ROC one of the most important evaluation metrics for checking any classification model's performance. Behind the scenes, the tool splits data into training and holdout sets. It then applies threefold cross-validation to evaluate the viability of numerous estimators in order to predict new and unseen data. Next, the tool generates pipelines using hyperparameter tuning and feature engineering for each estimator. Under normal circumstances, this could take hours or weeks. But with Auto AI, we trained our first two pipelines in a matter of seconds. The system continues to run until the process is finished. Auto AI has just trained 12 pipelines in a few minutes. We can now select a pipeline to see which estimator was used, such as logistic regression or XG boost. We can also see which transformations were created as part of the feature engineering step. Now let's view the leaderboard to see which pipeline won. According to our data, pipeline two was the winner. Here we can drill down into the quality metrics, the AUC ROC, the confusion matrix, the precision recall curve. We can even review the model information and see the features in degrees of importance. In this case, the most important feature to predict Titanic survivors was the sex of the passenger. This complex analysis could not have been easier or faster. We simply selected the data and column to predict and Auto AI trained 12 pipelines based on three unique estimators. All that remained for us to do was choose the best pipeline and deploy it as a web service for use in production. It's that simple. See it? Yep, we're back on there. All right, I know we, I know we got a little technical on your, and, and if you don't recognize some of those terms, that's okay. I mean, a data scientist uh, will, and it's not as scary as it may look. I just wanted to prove to you, this is, some technology that we've put out to really help clients up that ladder and once they get there to be able to to drive uh, ml models and keep them in uh production uh and it's real i mean we we entered auto ai came straight out of research we entered auto ai into a cago competition and it came in top 10 percent of i think it was consumer credit uh that we put it in there uh it was consumer credit risk so it came in top 90 percent of the data scientists there but essentially what it does is 
it builds models faster. That means it helps clean some of the data, like removing nulls I talked about earlier, does model training, hyperparameter optimization, if you know what that is. Um, it jumps the skills gap. We got a lot of, there's a clicker versus coder type of uh, scenario in the industry right now that, you know, there's some citizen data scientists. In other words, they, you know, they, they had to become data scientists by, by necessity. This helps them, they get started. Um, you can find signal from the noise. Let's say you were looking at something and you said, well, I wonder if this would be a good, a good um, scenario for machine learning. It can you know, do it real quick and say, oh yes, it's finding some good information. It'll rank all these models. So, hey, look, I, these models, there's many out there and uh, I am certainly not a, an expert in it, but it'll rate based on accuracy, based on those several models. And then it also deploys. It deploys uh, via REST APIs so that you can use it with your your applications. That's what it's doing at the at the top. Hey Al, I hope you've got a URL that you can share that let us know how we can go work with. I can do that. I'd be happy to do that. That's super exciting. Yeah. So at this point in time, where I get is there's two things when, when once a client is at the top of that ladder, that is you know if I'm in the C-suite, they're probably going. Two things that are that are scaring the hell out of me, and this was an IBM study of greater than a thousand C-suite executives. 63%, hey, look, say I don't get out of the technical skills to complete what I need to do. Hopefully, auto AI helps target that. Can't take away everything, don't get me wrong, but it'll help that. Then the next question becomes, well, I'm concerned about trust, privacy, transparency. So I got one thing to finish on. And the, it's the question of what does it take to trust the decision made by a machine? And I look at that and the business looks at that in terms of four quadrants, explainability, fairness, accuracy, and being open. Um, let, me, let me tackle each one. Explainable, what we've done is we've got technology, it's actually called OpenScale, but not to confuse you, it's part of the overall the, the platform that I've been talking about. It will lift up the hood on a model so that if you get a prediction, it'll show you, it'll explain exactly why it made that prediction. And what it also have is what's called contrastive explanations. So it'll tell you the minimum change for that model to go from a negative to a positive. By example, if you were giving out loans and this loan was denied for a certain person, it would tell you, hey, here's why it was, de it was uh, denied and here's what is needed for it to the minimum uh, change or action for it to be approved. Like by example, it may say, this person needs another $100,000 in their account, and then it will it will change to, to positive. So you can say that to the, the person looking to, to borrow money. Fairness is detecting uh, mitigation and bias. We use a, a theory called perturbation analysis, where you essentially switch parameters or attributes, whatever you would call it, features, and then make sure that they hold true uh, if they are switched, like if you can say all things being equal, you switch male versus female, and if the results are different, you know something's not fair, and it'll tell you why it's not fair and a better model that makes it fair. Thirdly, accuracy. The problem with machine learning uh, and uh, AI is that you can have what's called model drift, data drift. Like say, for example, uh, that you gave, you went out and you did a marketing campaign for a bunch of students. And so all of a sudden your data that you train the model on used to be have an average age of 50, uh, 50 years of age. Then you went to, did this marketing campaign on a university and then it, you put in a bunch of 20 somethings, 22, say whatever, you've got to retrain the model. Our, our, our tool auto AI will look at it. They'll, it'll, it'll de detect, Hey, look, you're having model drift. The feature that is, is uh, the cause is age. And here's what we need to do about it. And then lastly, we want to be open. Actually, we've got uh, at least um, two of these, uh, two of these are open source. Actually, there's three open source areas. One is Explainability 360. We open source that product. Fairness 360 is another open source. And we also have what's called a, a adversarial robustness toolkit that prevents hackers to get in your model. Now, why would you use our, our tool if we're open sourcing it? Because we obviously put it together, we integrate it, and it's got this overall platform uh, that uh, makes it extremely, extremely valuable. So, in summary, this is the way our, our, our data and AI portfolio looks. And you've got 
at the top, pre-built use case and, and Watson applications. We've got a product called like Watson Assistant. This is like if, if I'm a client and I have a customer service uh, use case and I don't want to do any machine learning myself. I just want to buy a pre-built app. Got that. If you want to build your own machine learning app, it's you know, Knowledge Catalog Studio, uh, Machine Learning and OpenScale. That's Prepare, Build, Run, and Manage. All built on our, our database family and all built on a microservices architecture called a cloud pack. And it also is set up because, you know, we've, again, that partnership with Red Hat, it's also set up uh, to be open. You can bring other products in uh, just as well. So I'll finish up and say this, and then I'll open up if there's any quick questions. You know, we're working with a lot of uh, companies right now, ESPN, if any of you do in the US do fantasy football, uh, the predictions are coming from, from our tools. Here at RBS, they've achieved a 40% call deflection rate with virtual agents. You can go around the horn here, but we're working with a lot of clients and seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of success. And in fact, um, I got to show this. I'm pretty proud of it. Forrester has evaluated, you know, a lot of our AI at the at the upper right uh, escalon of, uh, of value and and where industry leadership. So with that, I'll. Yeah, I mean, I'm very excited about you know where we are right now. The thing I would say just to end and and is to say that um, particularly for all the the folks that have been in the data business for a while, somebody like me is first thing is to show up. Um, I'm going to end where I started, and that is you are incredibly value valuable, but you got to continuously learn. Uh, you, you've you've got to be knowledge about AI. I guarantee you, the C-suite needs you more than you need them. <laughs> Um, you just you, you got to find your way up 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 that ladder just as well to make sure you say hey, here's what we can do here's what I suggest we do because they need those suggestions. Um, automation is the key. Uh, we're going to automate as much as we can. If you're not automating, you're getting behind. Third thing is is only add complexity complexity when it counts. This goes back to the discussion I had earlier when I said I see a lot of clients like moving data when they don't need to because I guess they know how to do that. If it's working, leave it. Use, take that hybrid strategy, that hybrid cloud approach. Keep that where it is, where you can get uh, faster to some of the, the new apps and the models that you maybe you want to put born first on the cloud. Climb the ladder fast and furious and know that um, IBM is, is, is certainly loyal to everybody else. So I'll pause there. I don't know. I can stay a little bit longer and, and answer questions if, if, if that's what we do here. That's, that's what we do. We ask the audience now if they have any questions. If you have any questions, use the go to webinar question and answer tool. We already asked the polling questions. We're on questions. Anybody have any questions for Al? Watching the question queue, waiting for somebody to ask a super question. <laughs> probably, we probably should have preloaded this. So can I just Google auto AI and learn about it that way? I mean, I can't hear I can't hear you anymore, uh, Scott. You kind of went went so bad. Check my audio. Am I mad? Can I Google, still can't hear you. Can I Google IBM Auto AI? How do we find? I, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just can't hear you. <laughs> well, shoot. I heard well, sh well, shoot. <laughs> That's all I can hear. So I will, what I'll do is, something about learning more about auto AI, what I'll do is uh, I'll get with you, Scott, and in the show notes, if you have them, uh, we can, uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll give you some links and stuff like that and, and, and uh, you know, give you some material that they, they can go check it out because it is out there. You can, you can grab it as part of Watson Studio uh, and, and play with it. I would love for you to do it. You can go out on, on, on the cloud and, uh, you know, use a, a, a free, uh, a trial and uh, go to town with it. Okay, our, our last question for our good-looking large audience. <laughs> Did you learn anything today? And while we're asking this question, and thank you very much, audience, for being here. Al loves an audience, and, and so do I. Uh, thank you, Al, for your awesome presentation. Very insightful. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. The IBM community is a sponsor today. 
again, go to IBM.com slash community. Okay, close the poll. Check this out, Al. 100% of our, uh, of our very intelligent audience learned <laughs> something today. I was very, I was very nervous. What if they'd all said no? <laughs> it's been a wasted hour. Well, that, that's how we judge the value of the show: is did people learn something they didn't know? Fantastic. Okay. And uh, replays and show news: dataviewshow.com/news. That's where you can get all the goodies. And that's the end of the show. Thanks again, Al, for joining us today. We'll put the music on and uh, wish everybody a. Happy Friday tomorrow and an awesome weekend. Fantastic. Thank you all for listening. And uh, look, I'll see you on Making Data Simple podcast. See you guys. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Al. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.